right, hi guys. I just wanted to uh, make a video going over the uh, results of the quiz that you guys took on Friday, kind of explaining all of the questions, uh, just to make sure you guys don't have any questions about those. Um, if you got anything wrong, you can definitely check here to see what uh, you missed. I tried to do a few little explanations uh, in the feedback, but this will be a little bit more in depth. If you want to uh, skip ahead to, to the questions you missed, feel free to do so. Um, so question number one, Mendel's hybridizations may best be described as which of the followings? So Mendel's hybrids were of true breeding individuals, so basically purebred individuals. And uh, the what he did is he took two true breeding individuals that had different forms of trait, right? If they had similar forms of the trait, then you wouldn't see anything in those uh, results, right? They would just look like both parents. So we wanted a purebred individual, you know, maybe with green peas and a purebred individual with yellow peas, uh, cross those together and see what forms happen in the offspring. So true breeding individuals, different forms of the trait of interest. Question number two, the genetic makeup of an organism and its physical appearance. So the genetic makeup is the genotype and the physical appearance is the phenotype. So just some definitions there. Question number three, the process of crossing over may best be defined as what? Um, so crossing over is important for uh, genetics when we're thinking about genetics, but we also talked about this in our meiosis chapter as well. So uh, crossing over happens in prophase one. Um, so we can already narrow down our answer choices here to prophase one. And that's where we have genetic recombination. So the switching around of genes occurring between homologous chromatids of non-sister chromatids, right? Non-sister homologous chromatids there. They switch around that information in my, uh, meiosis, uh, prophase one of meiosis. Question number four, in pea plants, the allele for round peas is dominant to wrinkled peas. A gardener has a plant he got from his neighbor that produces round peas. So round peas could be homozygous dominant or they could be heterozygous. He doesn't know which genotype it is. What does he do to determine that genotype? So in order to determine that genotype, you would do a test cross. A test cross is where you take a plant that has the uh, recessive trait because you know that what that genotype is, you know it has to be a homozygous recessive genotype in order to be wrinkled. Uh, so you do a test cross with wrinkled peas. And then if any of your offspring have wrinkled peas, you know that your new genotype is uh, heterozygous, right? Because uh, the heterozygous there is also donating one of those little Rs. Question number five, this is uh, related to uh, question number four. We have that pea plant uh, with uh, the dominant trait, round peas, but we wanna know the genotype. So we are doing a test cross and we observe that half of the offspring produce wrinkled peas. So what is the genotype of the plant she received from her neighbor? So these are the two possible Punnett squares that we could make, right? We have wrinkled, or wrinkled peas over here on the side, that's our test cross. And then the plant of interest, we could be homozygous dominant or we could be heterozygous. So when we fill in these boxes, we see that if our individual was homozygous dominant, then all of our offspring would have round peas. They would all be heterozygous. But if the individual that we're interested in here, if you cross that with the homozygous recessive and half of them have round peas and half of them have wrinkled peas, then you know what, you're, what you've got is, is heterozygous. So the answer here is heterozygous. Question number six, we've got two traits, trait A and B. If we have a mother that is heterozygous for trait A and homozygous dominant for trait B, mates with a father that is heterozygous for both traits, what percent of the offspring have this specific genotype? So we have to do a dye hybrid cross where we've got the two traits and we've got to um, put together all the different combinations of letters that we might see. So we've got mom up here across the top. Uh, so in this square here, we've got the first A and the first B. In the second square up at the top, we've got the first A and the second B. Then down here, we've got the second A, the first B, and then over here, second A, second B. And down here across the side, I've got the father. Same thing, we're just coming up with all of the different combinations of A's and B's that this individual has. Then when we fill in all of our boxes, we're looking for this specific genotype, homozygous recessive for the A's and homozygous dominant for the B's. We see that in two of these 16 boxes. So two out of 16 equals 0 0.125. So that's how we got that answer there on question number six. 
Question number seven, a man's mother died from having Huntington's disease caused by a dominant mutant allele that exhibits high penetrance. Uh, the daughter wants to be tested for the mutant gene, but he tells her not to bother because her chance of having it is zero. Is he telling the truth? Um, so if we look at these choices here uh, and kind of think about the information that we've got. Really, the conclusion we're going to come to is we don't know because we don't really have enough information, right? We know that the man's mother here died from this dominant uh, disease, these dominant alleles. So she could be homozygous dominant or she could be heterozygous. Um, but we don't actually know what the man's genotype is. We don't know what uh, the, you know, the, the daughter who wants to get tested, we don't know her mother's genotype. So there's a lot of pieces we don't know in this question. So we can't actually uh, say one way or another based on what we have. Question number eight. So what is a gene? A gene is a physical unit of inheritance. So uh, that's the correct answer for that one. Question number nine, the modern theory that explains Mendelian inheritance is called what? That is the chromosome theory of inheritance. Uh, so that's the theory that explains that Mendelian inheritance. Question number 10, during meiosis one, homologous chromosomes undergo chiasma formation. Uh, which of the following can happen now when the homologous chromosomes synapse or contact each other? Okay, so we are going to have uh, homologous chromosomes that are exchanging information. Uh, so question A here, homologous chromosomes exchange arms with one another via homologous recombination. That's what we're going to want uh, here in this answer choice. That's what's happening there. This one down here says homologous chromosomes exchange arms with one another via DNA replication. But DNA replication is not happening here. So, uh, so this is not uh, what we're talking about. And then the second choice here, homologous chromosomes uh, undergo a process by which random proteins are made via independent assortment. Also not what we're talking about here when we have this, uh, these homologous chromosomes contacting each other and, and switching around information. That's going to be answer choice A. Question 11, the number and appearance of a cell's chromosomes, including lengths, banding patterns, and centromere patterns are collectively called what? That is a karyotype, just another definition there. Question 12, hemophilia is not seen in individuals heterozygous for the hemophilia gene, thus the disease is recessive, right? If you're heterozygous for that, that gene, um, but you don't uh, show the trait, then that trait is recessive, okay? Question number 13, how would you determine the distance between two genes using experimental matings? So in this question, uh, what we're looking for here is going to be the frequency of crossing over between the genes. If they, uh, you know, if they frequently cross over, they're going to be really far apart. If they, if they never cross over, if they never switch around, then we can assume that they are very, very close together. Uh, be, and that, uh, that where the homologous chromosomes attach and switch around information, very unlikely to happen in between two genes that are very, very close together. Question 14, two genes located near each other on the same chromosome are said to be linked. Uh, so those are linked genes. Question 15, when a monohybrid cross occurs between two true breeding parents, what is the phenotypic ratios of the F1 and the F2 generation? Okay, so a monohybrid cross here. So we're just thinking about one trait, two true breeding parents. So they're going to be purebred individuals. When we cross two uh, homozygous individuals, right, we've got a homozygous dominant and a homozygous recessive. All of that F1 generation are going to be heterozygous. So they're all going to look the same. And then when we cross two heterozygous individuals in a monohybrid cross, the phenotypic ratio of the F2 generation is always a three to one ratio. So this is the correct answer down here. When we talk about a th 9 3 3 1 phenotypic ratio, that's only with a dihybrid cross. Uh, so when we're talking about two traits, but when we're talking about a monohybrid cross, just the one trait, that's going to be a three to one phenotypic ratio in that F2 generation. Question 16, which of the following best describes the F2 generation used in Mendel's experiments? Uh, so in Mendel's experiments, the F2 generation came from the F1 generation, but it was self-fertilized. So if you look at the figure that uh, talks about the P generation, the F1, the F2 generation, you can see that the F2 generation comes from F1, uh, but they are self-fertilized in Mendel's experiments. 
Question 17, choose the word that best describes an individual with only one copy of the genes. So that is going to be an individual that is hemizygous. So this would be uh, like if there's a gene that is on the X chromosome and we have a male individual who has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, they only have one copy of that gene. Uh, so that's going to be a hemizygous individual. Question 18, let's assume that color is determined by one gene in dogs. So an all white dog mates with a red dog and all of the puppies in the litter have white and red spots. So this is an example of codominance where we have uh, the white coloration and the red coloration happening at the same time. That's codominance. Question 19, inheriting an autosomal recessive disorder requires the person receive the disease causing allele from whom? So if you, it's autosomal, so this is not talking about sex chromosomes, and it's recessive, so we have to have two copies of that recessive allele in order to get that recessive disorder. So you have to get one from mom and one from dad, so you have to get it from both parents there. Question 20, which of the following refers to when a heterozygous individual displays a phenotype that is in between either homozygous type? So we had co-dominance a couple questions ago where we had both of the homozygous phenotypes happening at the same time. Um, but uh, when we have uh, a heterozygous individual that's in between, that's incomplete dominance, right? So if we had like a, a red flower and a white flower and the offspring is pink, that is incomplete dominance. So in between either homozygous trait. Question 21, list and define three different combinations of alleles that can occur. So we can have homozygous dominant, two big letters there. We can have a heterozygous individual, a big and a little letter, and then two little letters is our homozygous recessive. So you needed to list and define all three of those to get full credit on that question. Question 22, this is straight out of the homework. So uh, this should have been pretty straightforward, especially because I had posted a video review of the homework detailing every single question. Um, so if you want to more detailed explanation of this question, you can check out that video. Um, but we have a mouse that has round ears, uh, so a mouse that's homozygous for round ears and short tails, crossed with a mouse that's homozygous for pointy ears and long tails. So round ears is going to be our big E's, and short tails is going to be our little T's. So we've got homozygous for round ears and short tails. They're going to be crossed with a mouse that is homozygous for pointy ears and uh, long tails. So that's the other genotype there. When we cross those genotypes together, all of our individuals are heterozygous for both traits. So they both are going to, or they all are going to have round ears, that dominant phenotype for ears, and long tails, that dominant phenotype for tails. And when we have a dihybrid cross of two heterozygous individuals, we're going to see that 9331 phenotypic ratio. So nine of those individuals are going to have round ears and long tails. Three are going to have round ears and short tails. Three are going to have pointy ears and long tails. And then one individual is going to have both of the uh, recessive traits, pointy ears and short tails. Question 23, so we've got harbor seals that uh, have black fur color and gray fur color. Black is dominant to gray. These should not be the same or <laughs> different letters. That was my bad. Uh, they should either be both G's or both B's. I don't know uh, how that got messed up, so I apologize about that. Um, if a seal that is heterozygous for black fur is crossed with a seal with gray fur color, what genotypic and phenotypic ratios would you expect to observe? So this is also straight out of the homework. The only thing I did was change the type of animal and the colors. Um, so I think it was turtles in the, in the homework. So this is exactly out of that. Um, so we've got a heterozygous individual across the top here. Uh, our seal with gray fur color has to be homozygous recessive down here. So you can see that half of our individuals are heterozygous, so they have the black fur, and then half of our individuals are homozygous recessive and have the gray fur, so a 50-50 ratio there. Question 24, so we've got a practical joker in the hospital maternity ward who removed the baby ID bracelets. There are three babies that cannot be easily distinguished. In order to ensure the parents get the right ones back, we have to do a blood test. So mom is homozygous for type A. So this is what mom looks like there. She has two uh, A alleles. Dad is type O, so he has two O alleles there. And then babies are A, B, A, and O. So which baby belongs to them? 
So if we've got our AB baby, they have one A allele, one B allele. Our baby that has blood type A can either have two A alleles or they can have an, an A and an O. And then our type O baby has to have two O's there. Okay, so if we look at mom and dad, mom is always contributing an A allele. Dad is always contributing an O allele. So this is the only possible blood type that their baby can have. So this is their, their baby here, blood type A. All right, so if you have any questions, obviously feel free to let me know. Happy to try and clarify anything if you've got any questions. And then I promise not to uh, have any more questions where you have to upload things that didn't go so well. I know some people got it to work, some people didn't. Um, so, you know, any, any answer that I had in the, in the answer box there or in my email inbox, uh, I gave you as much credit as I could. Um, so feel free to get in touch with me if you've got any questions about any partial credit you received. Um, and then hopefully uh, the quiz is coming Friday on chapters 9 and 11 goes a little bit more smoothly.